and call our next panel together up here at the, uh, the front uh, on the subject of Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Well, no, four years this ago. Next session will be now Peter Bergen. Thank you, Stephen. Um, this uh, this uh, uh, panel, Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan, we just heard an excellent panel. Uh, I think the gentleman was correct not to characterize it as the war of ideas, but perhaps a competition of ideas. It seems in that competition, Islam will defeat Al-Qaeda before the United States will. And perhaps uh, as a sort of jumping off point for this discussion, but let me, let me, let me just... Uh, introduce first our panelists. We have the best panel, uh, panelists possible on this subject. Uh, Nir Rosen uh, called me a few months ago saying, I'm going to go in bed with the Taliban. And I was like, Nir, have you noticed all these journalists are being beheaded <laughs> when they embed with the Taliban? I mean, that was a somewhat kind of crazy idea 18 months ago, but it's really crazy right now. Nir, of course, ignored my advice. He, obviously, he survived. Uh, he also has been doing uh, groundbreaking work, not only with the Taliban in Afghanistan, but also uh, with Al-Qaeda members in Lebanon, many of whom are Iraq War veterans. Nir speaks fluent Arabic. I, I can be pretty sure in the history of the New Yorker, uh, or the history of journalism, Nir went from being a bouncer at a Washington DC nightclub to being a writer at the New Yorker with no intervening stages. And you may have, you, he wrote a brilliant book uh, uh, about uh, being inside the Iraqi insurgency, inside the, the belly of the green bird. Um, he is one of the leading experts on uh, Islamist militants around the world. To his right, Christine Fair, uh, speaks Punjabi, speaks Urdu, has done the best work, in my view, on the Pakistani madrasas, took a very skeptical view about the Pakistani madrasas, saying, wait a minute, let's look at Pakistani public schools. They seem to be graduating more terrorists than the madrasas. I think I'm correct in characterizing that. Uh, also, Christine was the lead author of the excellent report on the suicide bombers in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, her most recent work, and perhaps in some senses her most important, is the cookbook that she has just written, which I urge you to read. <laughs> Cuisines are the axis of evil and other irritating states. <laughs> it's not only hilariously funny, but it actually works. Uh, the Iraqi salad is pretty good and other, other uh, recipes in there. Um, and uh, both Seth Jones, uh, to my right, and Christine Fair, of course, work at RAND. Neil Rosen works both at NYU and New America. Uh, Seth Jones, uh, I think, has done the best work on the insurgency in Afghanistan. He's embedded multiple times in, uh, with uh, the various NATO allies in Afghanistan. He's got a forthcoming book coming out, Graveyard of Empires, about Afghanistan. He just did an excellent uh, report for, for Rand on the counterinsurgency uh, strategy that we need in Afghanistan. Uh, so an excellent panel. Um, Seth will kick things off. Thank you, Peter, and it's an honor to be here. And Peter, I apologize, you had to slog through my manuscript, so uh, kudos to you for, uh, for uh, providing comments. Uh, what I want to do is, is ask, and at least uh, uh, begin to answer, three questions. One is, who are the Taliban and other groups? Um, what are their goals, essentially? What are their similarities and differences? And what is their relationship to Al-Qaeda? Um, most of this work is based on um, my work in the field uh, over the last couple of years, um, including this, this year a couple of times to the border regions, uh, all the way up from the Kunar border down into uh, uh, as far south as, as Kandahar, Spin Boldock. Um, and then also, as, as Peter noted, a lot of this is being written up for a book that comes out in a few months from Norton on uh, In the Graveyard of Empires, America's War in Afghanistan. Um, what I want to do is begin by uh, looking for, for a second at this, um, the, the, the word that people often use to describe who the U.S. and its NATO allies are fighting in Afghanistan and who... Uh, many in, in Pakistan uh, refer to as well is, uh, is the Taliban. I find this a rather unhelpful uh, term, and, and I'll tell you why in a second. Because I actually think when you get on the ground and you begin to look at the organizations uh, one is dealing with, what you find is something that's, that's uh, perhaps more accurately described as a complex adaptive system. And what that means is a system that's diverse, that is uh, made up of multiple interconnected nodes, and it's adaptive in the sense that um, uh, it possesses the 
capacity to change and learn, uh, especially across regions. So in my view, when we talk about Taliban uh, or even other groups, I'm going to divide that into about six different categories, and, and, and one could further subdivide them. Um, the first are a range of militant groups, including uh, Mullah Omar's Taliban, which is based um, uh, primarily uh, in the area of uh, Quetta, Pakistan. Uh, you also get a range of other groups, um, uh, even on the Afghan side, uh, or at least that are uh, fighting on the Afghan side, the Haqqani network, uh, especially uh, Jalaluddin's son, Siraj. Um, uh, a range of groups like uh, Hezbo Islami Khalis and Hezbo Islami uh, Gulbuddin, uh, Hekmachar's organization, which uh, uh, operate really on the northern parts in the Kunar, Nuristan, Nangahar area, and then in the northwest frontier province in Bajur. Groups like TNSM, which operates in Bajur and north of Bajur in the tribal agencies. A couple of groups that have um, moved into this front over the last year or two, uh, particularly Jaish e Mohammed and Lashkar e Taiba. Um, I mean, the, this list could go on, including, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave aside the, uh, whether to call him the former or the current Baitullah Massoud, um, uh, <laughs> since there are, there appears to be some debate even within the intelligence community about whether he's, he's still with us or not. Um, but, but, but as you see, there are a range of different groups, and I've just hit a couple of them. Um, and even within those, we see even with the TTP, for example, you get a range of different groups. You get uh, Lashkar Islami, you get um, Anso uh, Ul Islam, uh, you're getting uh, parts of uh, TNSM as well. So you, get, you really get a range of groups. You're also getting a, a whole range of tribes uh, and sub-tribes and clans. This is the second category. Um, again, whether it's on the Pakistani side, whether it's the... Um, Masoods of South Waziristan Agency or the uh, Wazirs, uh, both South and North Waziristan Agency, um, and a range of different uh, tribes, sub-tribes, and clans. You're also getting political parties. Uh, on the Pakistani side, you're of course getting uh, uh, the JI and the JUI. You're getting a range of militia commanders on the ground. You're getting a range of political, uh, sorry, criminal organizations. Um, anything from the drug trafficking organizations that exist in uh, Baluchistan and, and southern Helmand province, as well as gem, timber, and other illicit trafficking that goes on in eastern Afghanistan and then in parts of uh, Pakistan across the border. And then, of course, you're getting state or government agencies involved. And again, on the Afghan side, you clearly have gotten Afghan national police involved in cooperating with Taliban. We saw in the attack in Wanat in Nuristan that the local district governor was actually involved in uh, uh, assisting the attack on the American outpost. Um, we see uh, on the Pakistani side, we see, of course, um, uh, concerns about Frontier Corps. There's been direct engagement between uh, the uh, U.S. military and Frontier Corps, um, ISI, uh, the Army itself, um, and then, of course, uh, Iran, uh, its uh, Quds Force, and a range of other organizations. So you have at least six different categories within them, um, subgroups and groupings. And so the point here is that when you get into villages and districts, either on the Afghan or the Pakistani side, how these uh, entities come together actually varies quite a bit. Uh, so in some places you may get uh, relationships between uh, Mullah Omar's Taliban groups, local sub-tribes and criminal organizations. Uh, what, what happens closer to uh, Waziristan is, is somewhat different. But it clearly is, in my view, a locally based insurgency to, um, to, to, to paraphrase what Tip O'Neill said about American politics, all politics in this region is, is local or is, is primarily local. So I think calling this a Taliban is actually um, uh, re really is a failure to understand, um, and, and this has serious implications for how one responds, is, is a failure to understand what, what really is going on. So if I move to some of the goals and the nuances of what we might call Taliban, um, uh, I think there clearly are even divisions within some of these groups. Um, we see uh, 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 divisions on the ground. And let me first say, by the way, that, that even Omar's Taliban is a fundamentally different organization today than what it was in the 1990s um, in, in a range of ways. Uh, first of all, it does not have uh, 
even if it had some sort of command control over the insurgency in the 1990s, and, and there are arguments there, it clearly does not now, in my view. I mean, the inner shura is still located in the area of Quetta, and there are regional shuras in places like Waziristan and Peshawar, but it does not have that sort of command and control um, that it, uh, it may have had uh, a decade ago. So, again, you're getting a loosely knit uh, uh, patchwork of... Uh, of militant groups, tribes, sub-tribes, clans, criminal organizations, state agencies, etc. And they really have, in my view, and, and we don't have time at this point um, to go through all of the objectives of these organizations and groupings, but they have, in many ways, very different objectives, some broader in scope, um, and we'll get to Al-Qaeda in a second, some much more narrow and, and um, uh, uh, parochial in scope, uh, including, for example, uh, Gubran Hekmachar's Hezbi Islami. Um, there are divisions within some of these organizations. For example, there are recent indications from the ground that uh, uh, Malvi Nazir of South Waziristan and some of his, uh, uh, some others from both South and North Waziristan have become, uh, have, have actually begun to at least form a block. It's, it's probably too early to tell how uh, significant this over the long run to defend the Wazir tribe's interests in um, North Waziristan Agency and South Waziristan Agency, especially against um, some of the Masuds. And part of this appears to be uh, Nasir still holds a grudge uh, against Masud for sheltering Uzbek militants that have been pushed out of, they were pushed out of some of the Wazir areas. Um, uh, the, the point, and, and, and as we look at a range of these groups that some collectively call Taliban, but I think is rather unhelpful, there clearly are splits um, uh, between many, if not most of them. I mean, there are, uh, there are some similarities. We can get to those in the question and answer session. But I wanted to, to finish by spending a little bit of time on the connection between some of these groups and Al-Qaeda. Um, and, and let me first say that that as in the 1990s, in my view, on the ground, there have always been some tensions uh, and some ideological differences between many of these groups we've just uh, uh, talked about and Al-Qaeda, especially Al-Qaeda based in, the, uh, in, uh, in areas of Pakistan. This is not just in North or South Waziristan Agency or Bajor, but, but of course in Baluchistan and a range of other areas where they're um, located. Um, Al-Qaeda has utilized support from uh, some local militants for its outer perimeter security, uh, but there still is, for example, uh, the, there appears to be in some areas, um, Al-Qaeda fighters look very disdainfully on the masses of, uh, of uh, uh, some of the local Pashtun militants. Um, and many, many of these local militants view Al-Qaeda as unwelcome foreigners. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to generalize, but there clearly are tensions uh, in various ways. There have been tensions over the use of suicide attacks, um, and as Chris has noted uh, really better than anybody on the Yunama, uh, Taliban in particular have been quite uh, mediocre, I think, at their use of, uh, in their use of suicide attacks. Uh, but there are links between Al-Qaeda and several of these groups, uh, including uh, Mullah Omar's Taliban, based again out of uh, Baluchistan, the Haqqani Network, which is based out of uh, Waziristan, and some of the foreign fighters, including some of the Uzbeks. So there is in my view, there is, in, there is clearly a link, and, and actually I would even go as far as saying um, that the links at the strategic, the operational, and the tactical level are actually closer than they were during the 1990s. Uh, in my view, Al-Qaeda is more involved in actual day-to-day -day military operations than it was during the 1990s. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I will uh, outline uh, a couple of ways in, in which uh, Al-Qaeda is involved. And the way I'm going to characterize it is, if you remember this, um, these commercials from um, a few years ago from the uh, uh, German-based chemical giant BASF, they, they ran these commercials which said, uh, we don't make a lot of the products you buy, but we make a lot of the products you buy better. I mean, that's the way I would actually characterize uh, what Al-Qaeda has done in this area, is uh, they've improved the tactical and operational uh, competence of some of the local Afghan and Pakistan groups who are able to manufacture a range of uh, a better uh, a products, improvised explosive devices, um, uh, for example. Um, but don't play a major footprint on the ground. They clearly have, one of the things that's been interesting over the past year or so, I mean, there clearly are e either Al-Qaeda or, 
or um, some other uh, Arabs or foreign fighters that have embedded the way, for example, a, um, a U.S. embedded training team embeds in, um, in Afghan National Army or Afghan National Police Forces. We have seen some embedding in, uh, in local, um, uh, whether it's Taliban or Haqqani Network or Hezbo Islami forces or TNSM on the ground. There has been embedding by al-Qaeda, but they do not play a major role in ground operation, at, at least in my view. Where the Taliban, or, or where, um, where groups like Al Qaeda have also been quite instrumental, in my view, is on the media and uh, propaganda efforts. I mean, the Taliban, for example, Omar Taliban, is a fundamentally different organization than they were in the 1990s on their use of propaganda. I mean, even, even before his death, people like uh, Mullah Dadullah Lang appeared somewhat comfortable in front of a, uh, a video camera. Uh, espousing his uh, his views uh, again, you never would have seen that at least in my view, in a anywhere near that sort of um, level during the 1990s. So, in a range of areas, what I would argue is it is a fundamental, you know, these uh, even Omar Taliban is a fundamentally different organization because of its relationship with Al Qaeda at a range of levels, including, for example, the use of suicide attacks. I mean, we saw we saw uh, one in 2001. Uh, Two in 2002, two in 2003, six in 2004, and then you see this, this significant increase. 21 in 2005, 139 in 2006, 140 in 2007, and, uh, and uh, what appears to be a, uh, an actually increase over 2007 and 2008. And one of the things I would attribute this to you is, is uh, Zawahri, among others, pushing um, uh, suicide attacks as a key tactic, though as Chris has pointed out, when it comes especially to Omar's Taliban, they've been rather ineffective at uh, killing, at least compared to um, other areas. Uh, I'm going to finish up with three brief conclusions based on this. Uh, first is, I actually think um, that uh, U.S., NATO, Afghan government, Pakistan government, other organizations have to, and I'm going to use this term, defeat these groups, especially uh, groups like the Taliban, for a range of reasons, uh, uh, killing or capturing especially senior levels of the organization. I think uh, we cannot expect a serious settlement between senior members of these groups and whether it's the Afghan government or the Pakistan government. I, in my view, uh, and, I, and I, we didn't have a lot of time to discuss this, the visions are fundamentally different. Second. Um, I actually strongly disagree with the, with the uh, argument pushed by Rory Stewart and others about um, uh, conceding territory to the Taliban. I would argue that the links between Omar's Taliban and al-Qaeda are actually stronger than they were during the 1990s, and it would be fundamentally dangerous, which leads me to my thirst, uh, third point, which is I think the issue is not trying to break al-Qaeda from groups like the Taliban. I think it's trying to split some of these groups from each other. There's been a history of fighting, for example, between Hezbo Islami, Hekmatyar in particular, and Taliban, including a range of other groups. We see it actually in, um, in uh, uh, along uh, uh, tribal lines, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. I think your, your issue is breaking some of these groups apart or also uh, uh, separating uh, supporters at the, at the local level from the leadership structure. Um, and and, and that, in, that, that means in, in particular um, uh, taking advantage of uh, grievances. I mean, I, I would say support levels for groups like the Taliban still do not pull, they do not pull well. What they appear to, to do, including on Afghanistan, is they appear to be unhappy with their government. People don't uh, appear to be particularly supportive of the Taliban itself. That means uh, there may be ways, as was done in 2001 and 2002, to break tribes, sub-tribes, clans, and other local entities from the top tiers of the organization. So I'm going uh, to conclude in that sense and, and thank, hand this over. Thank you very much, Seth. Uh, and now we'll hear from uh, Dr. Christine Farr. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for the plug. I should say that the cookbook came about because of Peter Bergen, so <laughs> we're doing a little bit of mutual back-scratching here. So um, my talk actually overlaps, I think, very nicely with Seth's. I'm going to be focusing um, my comments really on Pakistan, and in particular the relationship that that state has had and that it currently enjoys with a raft of militant groups uh, based in and from its territory. I think we all know 
that for a long time, not, not since just 9-11, but in fact for several decades, Pakistan has been a place where a raft of militant groups have operated. But for a number of reasons, in particular uh, following the events of 9-11, the salience of those groups and their capacity to imperil not only Pakistan's own security, but that of the international community, have really become apparent. And the threat from Pakistan persists despite receiving some $11 billion or more, the money keeps increasing every month. Yet despite those subsidies, Pakistan is more insecure, not less, and the sanctuaries have expanded, not contracted. Now, what's, what's very interesting to me, I've been following Pakistan for a number of years, and I think before 9-11, but certainly before 2004, you could with some precision sort of segment the militant market along a number of dimensions. You could, for example, look at their theater of operations and their targets. So you had those groups like Lashkar Taiba and Jaish al Mohammed that really focused upon Kashmir and India. You had the sectarian groups like Lashkar Jangvi, Sipe Sabe, Pakistan, that mostly focused upon killing Shia in Pakistan. Um, and you could also divide them by their sectarian affiliation. Are they Deobandi? Are they Jamaat Islami aligned? Are they Ehaleh Hadith? Now, I would caution that even before 9 11, that was a fraught exercise, and people did it at their peril, at least in part because the Deobandi organizations, which span Jaish al Mohammed and the sectarian groups, always had overlapping membership with each other and with the political party JUI. And for, for, I think, a lot of analysts of South Asia, early on in the war on terrorism, we were very dismayed by the U.S. willingness to focus upon Al-Qaeda while not focusing upon these Kashmiri groups. And, and I think we were concerned for a very straightforward reason. These Deobundi groups had actually been the Al-Qaeda outsourcers in South Asia. So you look at the folks who were targeting the French engineers in Karachi, the Marriott attacks, those were actually Lashkar Jangvi, the sectarian groups, groups that um, a very narrow um, but yet not a comprehensive understanding of the, of the Pakistani militant terrain would suggest you could ignore. Since 2004, what was always a fraught exercise, I would, uh, would argue, has become a dangerous exercise in terms of trying to segment the militant market, yet that is exactly what the Pakistani state is trying to do. There have been a number of really interesting alignments. Um, those groups that used to, for example, focus upon killing Shia um, have now relocated to Fatah, where they target Pakistani targets, such as the, the military, the Frontier Corps. And we've also seen the development of new groups. Since 2004, and, I, and I, say, I cite that date in particular because that's when we saw the Pakistan army move into South Waziristan. But I think the development of the phenomenon of the Pakistani Taliban may have begun before 2004. But by 2004, it was actually undeniable. Um, now, you can de debate the characterization of that militant formation all along the tribal areas um, and, of course, the settled Pashtun areas of the Northwest Frontier Province. You can debate whether it's really unified under the current or perhaps deceased, the terrorist formerly known as Baitullah Masood. <laughs> okay, you guys don't apparently listen to Prince. Uh, <laughs> in any event, you can debate what sort of structure exists amongst those groups, but you can't deny that there is a Pashtun social movement that has riven the tribal areas in the, adja the adjoining northwest frontier areas. And you, and you can't deny that groups that used to be sectarian in focus are now doing what had never been heard of before 2006, and that's conducting suicide attacks against the Frontier Corps, the Army, the ISI, its erstwhile sponsor, as well as political leadership. This is absolutely unprecedented. Um, Pakistan has also learned the hard way that what happens in Fatah does not stay in Fatah. So what we've seen, um, these retali- you guys, commercials, the Vegas thing, lunch, lunch, wake up dudes. Uh, <laughs> So it is true. What, what happens in Fatah clearly has not stayed in Fatah. Um, mostly through their networks, um, their Pashtun networks and mosques and madrasas, the militant groups that may have their roots in Fatah have an uncanny a canny ability to project into the settled areas. And so in retaliation for the Pakistani military operations against some militant groups, but clearly not all, you had a series of retaliatory strikes throughout the Pakistani heartland. And those linkages also go the other way around. It's not 
not simply the problem in Fatah emanating outward. Um, for those of you who watched the, the drama of the Lao Masjid unfold last summer, I want to point out that the Lao Masjid problem it wasn't new. It had been a long-standing militant and ISI redoubt. In fact, my colleagues that wanted to go and get the latest Jaisha Muhammad Masuda's harm musing would go to the bazaar outside of the Lao Masjid and buy whatever DVDs uh, were available, and there were many available. So this had been a long-standing asset that had really gone awry uh, in, in various ways. But because of so many of the students that were eventually killed in that operation were actually from SWAT, the, the revolt that happened in SWAT actually occurred because of the events on Lao Masjid. And I think for people who watched the internal security dynamics of Pakistan develop, this was very unnerving, because not only do the problems radiate from Fatah, but in fact, things that happen in the settled areas were able to exploit the militant infrastructure in those areas to reverberate um, in the other directions. What makes the Pakistani case so puzzling is that clearly the Pakistani military and armed forces are forward deployed. Um, they are certainly taking casualties. Um, now, of course, they do like to note the body count as signs that there could be no, uh, how shall we say, double game being played. But they certainly are forward deployed, and they are certainly killing some militant elements, namely the militant elements that harm their domestic interests. Um, the folks they're killing are, of course, not necessarily our high-value asset. And I am con consistently amazed that journalists, many of whom we all know, have had the opportunity to interview Beitullah Masood, but ordinance has somehow not found its way to his cave. So this is very puzzling. The, the Pakistan army, it's not just puzzling, it's disturbing. $13 billion later, we should expect Beitullah Masood to not be giving interviews to journalists working with the BBC. No slight on the BBC. They should be giving journalists from CNN interviews. <laughs> um, but there are some very disturbing realities with the underbelly of this forward deployment. For a number of reasons, the Pakistan army has preferred to use the Frontier Corps as the workhorse for the insurgency. The Frontier Corps, prima facie, for a person who doesn't know the region all that well, looks to be a good idea. They're, they're generally recruited locally, they speak Pashto. So at first blush, when you read all the counterinsurgency literature that says local forces are the ones that defeat the bad guys, you check all the boxes with the Frontier Corps, except for one horrible problem. Historically, they were the ones that have been training militants in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And so it's not surprising then that over the last several years there have been an increasing uh, frequency of leaks about Frontier Corps support to the Taliban. And these leaks have gotten increasingly brazen. Um, some of you may recall in June, we, the United States government, our armed forces actually bombed a Frontier Corps position, um, and the, the excuse for this was that they were actually firing on our troops. Now, while this was an incident that made um, the most flash in the news, I assure you that it was not an isolated event, that the problem with the Frontier Corps have been ongoing, and they've been well known. Then the U.S. government has tended to say that the Frontier Corps um, is not actively helping the Taliban. They've tended to justify uh, working with the Frontier Corps, saying that they're, they're poorly trained, they're poorly manned, they lack medical evacuation equipment, they feel let down by the Pakistan Army and they don't trust the Pakistan Army. All of these things are true, but elements of the Frontier Corps still help the Taliban. Um, and, and this is an inescapable fact, and it's very difficult to, to square um, how this is the workhorse of the counterinsurgency when this is clearly a compromised um, Workhorse. Now, I'm not going to t paint the entire Frontier Corps with the same brush. Clearly, there are fellows who really are undertrained, they're poorly equipped, and they just want to get home at the end of their deployment. And if the Taliban wants to come screaming by in their Hilux, you know, they're going to do that. But there, we also can't be deluded that there are, in fact, active individuals in the Frontier Corps who are supporting the Taliban. Um, there have also been, particularly this summer, very disturbing reports about the ISI actively supporting the Taliban. Um, I think one of the more alarming reports was about the ISI involvement in the Indian bombing, um, the, the, um, the bombing of the Indian embassy in Kabul. This is all, of course, very disturbing news. So, you know, I'm a friend of Pakistan. I understand it's hard to reverse course, but we've got some real issues with this partner. And it's becoming very clear that while Pakistan has moderated the activities of some militants and while it's pursued al-Qaeda with some vigor, albeit under intense U.S. pressure, 
It doesn't appear as if Pakistan has strategically abandoned militancy as a tool in prosecuting its foreign policy objectives in India, Kashmir, or, or elsewhere. And these are the, the realities that riddle U.S.-Pakistan relations. What's also become very clear is that Pakistan itself has no real strategy. Um, if you look at uh, publications that describe the Pakistan army's beliefs as well as Pakistani public opinion, they seem to be generally flummoxed about the nature of the problem that they confront. And you can sort of tweeze out two general strands. One strand is that we are coming under attack not because we've had three decades of supporting militancy in various guises and that this sort of is a classical blowback of proxies gone awry, but rather they're under attack because of their embrace of the United States. And if they back away from the U.S. and they forgo the policies that Washington wants them to pursue, they can restore the status quo ex ante. And some people look at Kiani's, that's the chief of army staff, as some of his recent actions is really embodying that. He's backing away from coin counterinsurgency, he said as much. Um, the evidence looks as if the spigots in Kashmir have opened in an effort to sort of restore the morale of the Pakistan army and to basically diminish the raft, the rift that's occurred between the army and the Pakistan people. On the other hand, there really are those that say, we have a serious problem. And the, the policies of appeasement, of, of making peace deals with these various Taliban, have really ceded Pakistan authority. And it's eroded um, the, the general Pakistani way of life. And certainly, if you talk to any of the women that were harassed in around the Lao Masjid last year, that would certainly be an opinion that they would espouse. But though even those people don't know how to go forward. If you look at Pakistani public opinion polls, Pakistanis don't fear Al-Qaeda. Many Pakistanis don't even believe that Al-Qaeda exists. And they're more likely to say that the United States is the biggest source of a threat to them than is Al-Qaeda. So very clearly, the heart or the, the ballast of our efforts really need to be engaging Pakistanis who really are going to be the ones that can bring Pakistan to the fight or not. And if you look at the last seven years, we've had actually just the opposite policy. We've been pursuing the army. It is the army who actually has the conflicted objectives to support some aspects of militancy while fighting others. And we've done very little to support Pakistani civilian engagements. And I think I saw um, a, a time is up cue back there. So I'm going to wrap this up and sort of put on the table what is almost an impossible task. We know from the last seven years that supporting the army, supporting uh, army strong men, does not get us where we want to be. Uh, Musharraf may have done a good job at, at trying to sell the army as a modernizing force, but no army is a modernizing force for all of us who know armies. They're not the bastions of, of liberality uh, in, in most countries. And Musharraf can't lead his people to have a belief about the war on terrorism when he himself has no credibility. Um, there has been a lot of enthusiasm about the newly elected government and Zardari. But for those of you who know Zardari, Mr. 10%, the word on the street, he has a promotion. He's now Mr. 40%. <laughs> At least Musharraf had some level of legitimacy on 9-11. Uh, after the elections and after being declared president, Zardari doesn't have that legitimacy. So it's questionable whether Zardari can lead Pakistanis to come to a different opinion. So a number of folks, um, Ashley Tellis for one, myself another, um, Lisa Curtis who unfortunately had to leave a few minutes ago, We've all sort of came upon this sort of equilibrium position that we really have to prosecute if Pakistan is ever to be at peace with itself and with its neighbors. The first thing that we have to do is that we actually have to forge a real working relationship with the Pakistan army. Now, some of you may say, don't we have that already? We actually don't. What we have is a highly transactional relationship with the army. We don't sit down. We don't have a strategic dialogue. In fact, I'm amused that the strategic dialogue did not even come into being in 2006. And it's neither strategic nor is it a dialogue. But it, 2006, I mean, this is really quite astonishing. So we don't have a working relationship with the army. We have this idea that we, we pay them for operations that we don't jointly plan and hope they did the right operations. And the evidence is that this program, of course, has been massively abused. But so we have to forge a real working relationship with the army. And I'm going to tell you right now 
that this is very difficult to do. I'm not so worried about political Islam in the Pakistan army. I'm worried about anti-Americanism. And it has nothing to do with us being an unreliable partner. This goes back to the 1965 war. This, this is an old, accumulating history, and we have to understand that. So these are the challenges of building our relationship with the Pakistan army. It's not just about money. In fact, all of the money that we've dumped into the army without any joint planning, without any sort of joint consensus on what the goals are, has actually fostered corruption within that institution. It hasn't fostered good governance or anything. The second task, which is almost as heroic as the first, is that we have to build at the same time, strategically, uh, the institutions that can support democracy in Pakistan. The, the army has had six decades. We can't say for certain that the civilians are going to do a better job. But there's never been a true democracy in Pakistan. It's always been directly or indirectly overseen and managed by the army. To give you an example, uh, Kiani made a big splash when he presented a four-page budget for his army before the Senate. In most countries, that would be expected, not newsworthy. Um, it was all the more risible because the Pakistan Constitution neither permits the Senate nor the National Assembly to change the Pakistan army budget. <laughs> so what was the point of that drama, uh, us here in Washington? So we have to do these two things, forge a real relationship with an army that quite frankly despises us and has become very accustomed to large amounts of money without any accountability. And we also at the same time forge a relationship with people who are deeply alienated by our policy. And we don't have the opportunity uh, to let another 10 years go by without making serious movement on both of those fronts. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll start quickly with uh, Lebanon. It's a great place to meet Al-Qaeda-related guys because uh, they're relatively friendly, whereas in Iraq they would have probably cut your head off. Um, and there's been a blowback from Iraq. Uh, the surge didn't work in Iraq. It was in internal Iraqi dynamics that forced Sunnis to, to realize they had lost the civil war and uh, forced Al-Qaeda to be, uh, either join the awakening groups or seek shelter in Syria or Lebanon. And we're seeing more and more of a blowback of these guys, a center of gravity shifting towards Syria and Lebanon. Lebanon being a failed state is a very convenient location for uh, former fighters. And the first real sign of uh, blowback from Iraq was the fighting uh, in uh, the Nahal Barad camp two summers ago in, in northern Lebanon, where you had mostly uh, foreign, non-Palestinian, uh, Lebanese or Iraqi or Saudi, uh, Algerian, Yemeni, Omani, uh, a lot of them veterans of Iraq. Uh, these fighters formed groups uh, throughout the, the Palestinian camps, but eventually sought shelter in one in the north, taking advantage of basically Lebanon's failed state, ended up clashing with the army. Um, but there were attempts to ins instrumentalize them by people very close to the uh, official Sunni establishment in Lebanon, people in fact backed by the U.S. in some cases. Um, and Lebanon... Um, the, the uh, Hezbollah de defeat over Israel in 2006 and Hezbollah's <laughs> victory in the mini civil war uh, that we saw last May um, has done a couple of things. Uh, Al Qaeda is very jealous because who is the only successful army to uh, confront the Israelis? It's Hezbollah, a Shia group uh, that more and more is despised among the Sunni establishment at least. Um, likewise, Hezbollah being a powerful uh, movement and military is making some of the more radical Sunnis feel very nervous. Um, and you hear them calling Hezbollah Hezbollah, Lot being a lot from the Bible uh, symbolizing sin, or Hezbollah Shaitan, party of the devil. Um, I met two weeks ago with Sheikh Bilal Baroudi, uh, the most important Sunni cleric in northern Lebanon, uh, very close to the uh, future movement, the official Sunni establishment. He told me that uh, Shias are more dangerous than Jews that Shias are like a cancer or an AIDS in the body of the Muslim nation because they're threatening the, uh, uh, the Sunni Islam from, from the inside. Um, and this is really a dominant view. He's an establishment figure and this is what you hear uh, throughout Lebanon these days. Um, Syria and Lebanon are part of Sham, the sort of uh, 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 the more ancient way of, of referring to this region. And more and more I, I've been hearing since 2005, 2006, people in Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon talking about how um, there'll be a future final confrontation in Sham um, and people have, some of them have been flocking over there. Uh, I'll move on quickly to uh, Afghanistan though, that's uh, much more interesting. 
Um, I was picked up by two Taliban commanders in Kabul, and we drove down to Razni. Razni is a province 100 miles south of Kabul. You go through Wardak. As soon as we hit Wardak, the town of Salar, 50 miles out of uh, Kabul, we were basically in a war zone, Taliban fighting Americans. Everybody had to stop and wait for a couple of hours for the first battle to end and move on a little bit down the highway, wait for the second battle to end. This is the famous Highway 1, the Kabul to Kandahar Highway that everybody was so proud of. It's completely destroyed. You know, when you're driving, you have to circle from side to side because every couple of minutes there are huge craters from roadside bombs. And on both sides of the road, you see uh, destroyed convoys supplying the U.S. and British military just uh, burned and we're talking dozens of trucks. Um, and these attacks are occurring basically on, on Kabul's back door. Um, in the backyard, if, if, once you leave Kabul, you realize that this thing is completely lost and there's absolutely no hope of turning it around. Um, you just, you, you, when you interact with the Taliban, you see their extreme confidence. Um, I mean, negotiation might be a great idea, but I, I think that the Taliban are so confident these days that they probably don't want to negotiate. Uh, what do they have? Uh, what, what do you have to offer them, really? Um, th their control is really approaching Kabul. You have night letters, the threats uh, being delivered seven kilometers out of the, outside of Kabul city. Um, and more and more, indeed, the Taliban are a Pashtun nationalist movement, but they are also more linked to, uh, to the global jihadist movement than they were in their previous iteration as the state in Afghanistan, uh, more aware of the struggles in Iraq and Palestine. Um, the first commander that picked me up was, uh, he'd, he'd been injured in fighting against Massoud in the 90s, um, and then, uh, had recently been injured fighting a rival Taliban commander. This is one of the first signs I saw that there's a lot of infighting. And uh, in fact, the infighting almost cost me my life. He was a senior commander in Ghazni um, in one district. His men had clashed with a, a rival senior commander from the Andar district. That guy had some Pakistanis and Arabs with him. They wanted to close down a girls' school. The guy I was with, his men killed the Pakistanis and Arabs because they opposed closing down the girls' school, and this bad blood remained. Um, he had about 500 men under his command, this guy, and he was sort of a liaison for the, the district with the Taliban Minister of Defense. On paper, the structure is very organized. You have uh, Minister of Defense, of Education, you have the, the media guy that you can call up and have better access to than any of the coalition or, or uh, Afghani uh, media people. Um, you have Taliban governors in every province. These days, because of the split between Haqqani and uh, Mullah Omar, you often have two Taliban governors. For example, Logar has a Haqqani governor and a Mullah Omar governor, although we haven't seen too much fighting yet, I, I think, uh, based on those divisions. Um, now, I was with a couple of commanders, as I said, um, so got to talk to them quite a bit. Um, one of them belonged to Hizb Islami in, in, uh, in, in the 80s. Um, had fought the Soviets, and he told me he joined the Mujahideen be, um, because um, uh, he joined the Taliban in the 90s because the Mujahideen were robbers, and he wanted peace in Islam. This is usually the the, uh, the reasons people gave me for joining the Taliban, either then or, or now. They couldn't get much beyond uh, their real Muslims and the, their foreigners in our country, as much as I pushed them. Now, uh, in both cases, in fact, in all cases, everybody agreed that when the foreigners left they will be willing to negotiate with the Afghan police, the Afghan government, the Afghan army, there are Muslims, there are brothers. Um, there was a real willingness and there was a distinction being made between them and the Americans, although everybody hated Karzai and said they wouldn't want to deal with him. All the various commanders, I think I met with about six uh, district and village level commanders, agreed that women and girls could go to school provided they were properly uh, covered up, of course. Um, if they weren't covered up, then they would go with boys and they would get HIV, they told me. Um, there were some Arabs and foreigners coming in through this area to conduct attacks, but in general, uh, the, the commanders and fighters I met were hostile uh, to Pakistan, to Iran, to, uh, to uh, the outside world as, as a whole, almost. Um, some, most of the commanders had gone through madrasas in Kuwaita in, uh, in, in Waziristan. Um, and had, had then come in. I met one 18-year-old kid who had only uh, been with the Taliban for two weeks. Um, his parents still thought he was in a Majusan in, in, uh, in Kuwaita. Um, one of the commanders I was with, I stayed in his house. Uh, he had family. Uh, he had a, a brother that was going to a state school in, in, in a nearby district. 
um, another brother who was just a farmer. The family wasn't very much involved in, in the jihad, just the fact that his, son, his brother was going to a state school was impressive given that um, some Taliban often uh, you know, destroyed the schools and everything. Um, we watched Al Jazeera um, and then uh, he switched to an uh, Afghan channel and he was watching Indian soap operas with women that were sort of relatively scantily clad. I was very surprised and he said, well, it's just a family drama. Um, <laughs> and then he switched to the uh, American uh, Iranian uh, exile the satellite pop st music station, um, which is uh, really bad music, but it's uh, something that the Taliban, of course, would have frowned upon. Um, and to him, it wasn't a big deal. And that seemed to be the case with quite a few of the commanders I met. Um, I won't call them moderates or liberals, but there's certainly been a great deal of pragmatism in, uh, in what they're willing to accept. Uh, the female education, negotiating with the Afghan government, the use of technologies they had previously not accepted, the internet, com computers, um, television, film, things like that. Um, of course, the friendly guy I was with it also cl claimed to have killed 200 so-called spies himself. He's uh, basically anybody that wasn't uh, with them was against them. Um, and their confidence was astonishing. Uh, this is the Andar district. Um, they were patrolling in broad daylight in, uh, in, in groups with RPGs, AK-47s, PKMs, a belt, belt fed machine gun, um, recordless rifles, very comfortable, not a care in the world as if there was no Americans in the country. And this control isn't only in, in, uh, in Ghazni, it's, uh, you could see the same thing in Wardak, uh, only 50 miles away, and perhaps even less than that. That kind of control and, and confidence and comfort among the Taliban is right around Kabul. Um, There were a few cases of uh, some of these guys saying they would they like to fight the Americans when, they, when the Americans leave because they've destroyed our country, things like that. Um, they'd like to go on a fight in Chechnya. Uh, they, they displayed more knowledge of uh, jihads outside of uh, Afghanistan than I think their predecessors would have in the 90s, thanks to some access to, to, to television, which was contingent upon access to electricity. Most of them got their news from the BBC Pashto service. Um, I met a couple of guys who spoke Arabic. One of them had been in a Saudi prison for a few months. Um, he, he said for uh, Mujahideen activities. Um, the morning after we were watching those Iranian uh, uh, pop music uh, videos, the Taliban commander I was with got a call from a local patrol that had been in the area. They were complaining. They told him, well, we heard music coming from your house. So he said, no, it was just Al Jazeera. Um, there's been a lot of really disturbing trends um, in the last couple of months. August, there were 986 security incidents recorded by the UN. That's 44% more than August of 2007, which had 686 incidents. August, when I was there, was really a remarkable month. You had three of the IRC uh, Western aid women killed on, on the road in Logar in broad daylight on their way to Kabul. Um, ten French soldiers killed in Sarobi in uh, Kabul. Um, six suicide bombers in at least in an attack in, in Khost. Um, the attack against the NGO workers was, was a, a big shock for the NGO community because of the Taliban response. In the past, they had somehow tried to apologize or justify it. We thought they were military, it was an accident, things like that. But this time, the final statement was basically like, uh, yeah, we killed them and we're proud of it and we do it again. So, it, um, and the fact that they were women didn't matter. It really sent a, sort of a, a, a shock wave throughout the NGO community. Um, and in the last month, there's been a lot of disturbing incidents uh, that demonstrate uh, Taliban confidence and the Afghan government's incompetence. You had two suicide bombers in Kandahar city entering the police uh, headquarters. Um, it really demonstrates the uh, inability of the police to defend themselves. Um, police defecting in Helmand to, to, to join the Taliban. Um, there's really only a couple of provinces that don't suffer irregular incidents. Of, uh, of, of extreme violence. Um, they're stopping people, uh, taking them off buses and killing them. In Ghazni, the Taliban governor actually issues uh, Taliban uh, state uh, passports and, and ID cards. They conduct uh, trials and adjudic they adjudicate disputes between farmers. Um, they really have taken over the countryside and it seems inconceivable that um, anybody can, can turn them back unless you had a few hundred thousand troops. Um, and I, I think uh, I disagree with Seth over uh, 
or the need to defeat them. I think the U.S. isn't capable of defeating them. The U.S. didn't defeat al-Qaeda in Iraq. It was the Shia militias who basically cleansed Sunnis from Baghdad and pushed them out so much that, that they, uh, they were defeated, in fact, by a, um, sort of removing the sea in which they, they swam. Um, there's a real sense of hopeless, hopelessness among the international community in, in Kabul. Uh, people are, are trying to think of their exit strategy. Afghans with money are trying to think of where they're going to move to, India or Dubai. Um, you have warlords from minority ethnic groups in the west and the north beginning to rearm. They're realizing that the Taliban are gaining control again. The Americans can't stop it. The Afghan government is a, is a joke, of course. Um, so they're beginning to uh, reestablish their militias, rearm themselves. Um, and a lot of hopes are being placed on the, uh, on the elections. Um, so far, registration is, is, uh, is way overdue. And the, uh, the notion that you could have registration for the upcoming elections, let alone voting, I think is, is ridiculous in much of the country. There would just be a death sentence for the people involved. Uh, we saw what happened in Iraq when uh, Sunnis in the first election either didn't vote because of a boycott or because of security concerns. Uh, so this was a minority group, but they were basically ridden out of Iraq's future and pu it pushed them towards a civil war. Pashtuns, of course, are the largest group in, the, in uh, Afghanistan. Um, if they're going to be disenfranchised, you're really going to be pushing the country towards civil war. And there's just no way that you're going to have elections in any Pashtun-controlled areas or in much of the country where the violence is really almost everywhere, leaving aside Panjir and a few other uh, areas that are firmly in the hands of, uh, of Tajik groups. Um, so uh, the only hope is some form of negotiation. Um, and, and, and I agree that we can sort of, it looks like the international community can, can pull some of these people apart. The commanders I was with, um, there was really nothing to distinguish them from uh, any other Afghan, or at least uh, Pashtun, in terms of their ideology. Uh, people often join the Taliban because they've been snubbed for a contract, because some other tribe got to go to the police, because the Americans shot one of their men on a bicycle when he was approaching a checkpoint, which is a true story. Um, there, all these guys dis displayed hostility towards suicide bombings. The guys I was with, I don't know if they reflect Taliban elsewhere, but it shows that there's a great deal of pragmatism, hostility to, to, to foreign fighters, to suicide bombers, and uh, perhaps with the right policy, which I think the U.S. is too clumsy to engage in, you could sort of pull them into the process. Thanks. Thank you. And I think Christine you know, made a very important point that the Pakistani groups the Shia groups, the Al-Qaeda-like groups, the Kashmiri groups have sort of also morphed together ideologically and tactically. Now, if you accept that the Pakistani groups have morphed together ideologically and tactically, and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, they're all sort of on the same team, and there might be differences, you know, what Freud called the, the narcissism of minor differences, but it's essentially that they are more or less have the same view and goals. That raises a very important question about negotiations. We heard uh, a discussion of negotiations in these panels, and of course, as uh, my CNN colleague Nick Robertson broke the story that um, some former members of the Taliban, fairly senior, now in, you know, went to Riyadh, went to Mecca, sat down with King Abdullah and talked with Afghan government officials. And clearly, this is the way forward, but I guess the question to the panel is, do these people really have any legitimacy? I mean, Mutawakil, who was a former foreign minister, was one of the negotiators. This is a guy who's been in U.S. custody for two years. Even at the time the Taliban existed, he was a sort of quote-unquote moderate Taliban who would you know, do things like watch television. So who are the... I mean, the negotiations do seem to be the right way forward. The question is, who are the interlocutors that make sense? And part of that answer must surely be, I mean, I think for the Afghan government, somebody like Gul Bledig Hekmatya, who's the only prime minister in history who was shelling his own capital on a daily basis in the, in the mid-90s, is not somebody you'd really want to sit down with. So who, is accept, who are the acceptable people that you can negotiate with with the Taliban? Or do you have to throw all these pre preconceptions out and say everything's on the table? I spoke to some... Uh, to, into the mic. I spoke to some former Taliban about this issue exactly. The, the problem with the so-called moderate Taliban who you'd want to use to negotiate is that they're not military commanders and you've had very few former Taliban military commanders come into the so-called reconciliation process. Um, but what a lot of these former uh, Taliban and uh, Hikmatia or Mujahideen commanders were saying was that uh, we, we should rely on uh, local mullahs, for example, Logar. Uh, province that produced many mullahs and some of them had offered to serve as uh, mediators. One of them uh, was in fact the former teacher of Mullah Omar and he'd come down with some other representatives and he tried to get money for, from the EU to make this happen and it somehow didn't work out. Um, but you, you would have to use, I think, somebody respected by both sides, certainly not the Afghan government, but uh, everybody seemed to agree that local clerics, local tribal leaders, and a lot of people suggested that the, the Saudis should have a prominent role in this. 
um, and, and that uh, they're one of the few countries that could act as such a mediator as well. Yeah, another model is in Iraq, there's individual ceasefires, hundreds of individual ceasefires with particular commanders. That might be a more effective approach than sort of negotiating, say, with Mullah Omar. But given the guys that I met, in this just one district, how representative that is, I think that is theoretically possible because there was so much tension between various groups and, and bickering and fighting um, and tribal rivalries that it seemed like uh, they weren't only focused on fighting uh, the, the foreign occupation and that they really didn't have much of an ideological reason for, for the fight except that there are foreigners in our country that are coming into our villages. So the right uh, offers, I think, could have persuaded them individually these commanders of different villages within the district to come in. Chef? Yeah. Um, this is a fundamental question, uh, obviously one where there are some disagreements on. A um, couple of responses. One is, who do you negotiate with? I mean, the fact that there are over a dozen different groups brings up this question of A, who do you negotiate with, and B, do, do they have any ability to enforce an agreement? I think the fact that you have multiple groups involved makes um, this type of negotiations with senior levels of organizations uh, extremely difficult. I think uh, the question is not sitting down with the leadership structure of the groups. I think the, uh, the, the, the better response is what's been historical within um, Afghanistan, and that is negotiating with, with uh, the sources of local power, that is local tribes, sub-tribes, clans, um, and other organizations, uh, tribal jirgas that have uh, a power and some legitimacy in their areas. Now, that, that means in one sense it's more difficult to um, uh, negotiate because, again, you're dealing with a range of different actors, but I think they have, if anybody has some ability to enforce agreements on the ground, it is these types of organizations. Um, so I think that's actually the better way of looking at this rather than the top down. And, and third, um, I don't see also a lot of bargaining space. I mean, one of the things that, there's a whole literature on getting a negotiated settlement with major groups. Um, I, I would say most of the conditions now do not exist for a big peace settlement. That is, there's not a stalemate at the moment. I think actually quite the opposite. I think uh, uh, the insurgent groups are, are, uh, view themselves and probably are slightly winning. There's not a stalemate. Second, um, there's not a lot of bargaining space. That di there are huge differences in the vision they have towards, um, towards the country itself. And third, we've also seen it's much more difficult to establish a big peace settlement when there are multiple groups rather than having what we had in El Salvador, one main FMLN group that you could negotiate with that transitioned to a political party. So I would say it's as mostly fruitless to try and do your bargaining and negotiations at a big macro level and actually I'd push this down um, the, the, the way this has historically been done. Christine? Yeah, my, my comments are really on the various peace deals that the, um, that the Pakistanis have forged with, with varying degrees of failure. I mean, the problem with those deals is that they were, in fact, ratification of failure, military defeat on the ground. And when you actually look at the terms of the deal, they basically compensated the Taliban for their losses while not expecting the Taliban to compensate uh, victims um, of, of their uh, various attacks. They provided absolutely no ability to verify that the Taliban were honoring their commitment. And essentially what those peace deals did, they, they sought to buy a separate peace, i.e., you know, relief from attacks domestically at the expense of those attacks in Afghanistan. So when I look at those attacks, it's very, those peace deals, it's very difficult to see that anything could have come out of them other than the continued legitimization of these local Taliban leaders. Um, the other problem, going back to the, to the idea that Seth put forward, I, I can't really speak uh, to the Afghan side, but in Fata, the so-called jirgas that are often hailed up as a pathway to, to peace, have actually been fundamentally um, eviscerated through the, the events of the recent years. And in fact, beyond that, the last three decades, the entire notion of a jirga has slowly transformed. Um, in the 70s, uh, a jirga used to be largely comprised of tribal leaders. The mullahs weren't even allowed to attend. Maybe they would pray for a good outcome. And they were always held in public spaces. Today, jirgas are called by local Taliban affiliates. They're held in mosques and madrasas. So that entire institution has really been appropriated. So I'm dubious that at least in the tribal areas that this is going to be a meaningful way of going forward. And especially when what their goals are, uh, they're antithetical to the state. They want to form micro emirates of Sharia. So Pakistan has a lot of work to do, and it has to figure out, you know, what does it want to do with those areas, and how is it going to achieve them? 
We're going to throw it open to questions, but first, I just want to inject uh, a little bit of optimism because we've heard a lot of pessimism about Afghanistan. I mean, in any insurgency, the center of gravity is the people, and there's been a great deal of polling data on Afghan attitudes, and um, the U.S.-led invasion is still a popular thing in Afghanistan, much more, I mean, very, very different than in Iraq. Support for the United States has dropped from 57 percent to 42 percent in the last two years, but it's still double the numbers of, let's say, Americans' favorable views of Congress or Americans' view of President Bush. So it's, it's still at a, you know, it's at a, it's at a 50, 50 percent level. Um, and so that gives us a tremendous opportunity. Support for the Taliban in southwest uh, Afghanistan is at 23 percent, but o overall in the country is at 5 percent. They're polling very close to zero. And I think from a, just a step back a minute, what, what strategic threat does the Taliban pose the Afghan government? The answer is none in, a, in the big scheme of things. They pose a major tactical threat, but not a strategic threat. There is going to be no Taliban-style Tet offensive on Kabul. They just don't have the men to do it. So I think it's a glass half full, glass half empty in Afghanistan. The trend line is downwards, but I think there are still some grounds for optimism. So with that, we'll do questions, and please identify yourself. Wait, wait. Hi, my name is Diana Douglas. I'm from National Public Radio. I'd like to have all the panelists please address whether it's a good strategy for the United States to be focused on Osama bin Laden himself, how good of a recruitment tool he is, and how good he is at organizing al-Qaeda at this point in Pakistan and Afghanistan. I want... I don't have an opinion on whether the U.S. should be pursuing him or not, but um, certainly as a symbol, I was surprised uh, because I disagree with Peter about this in the past when I interviewed many uh, guys in Lebanon who were linked to exporting fighters to, to Iraq or who had, were fighters who had returned from Iraq, um, people who viewed themselves as part of Zarqawi's network. Um, and I asked them what cleric they respected, what thinker they respected the most. Everybody said Sheikh Osama was the number one guy, and then there were others. In fact, that brings me to the point about some of the uh, um, former jihadist intellectuals who uh, sort of changed their mind. Everybody dismissed them as sellouts. Nobody took them seriously anymore because they had sold out. So, but I didn't find anybody who was convinced um, by their uh, retraction. But anyway, Sheikh Osama was a, a very popular symbol uh, throughout Lebanon, sort of Al-Qaeda community at least. I also don't, frankly, have a strong opinion, oddly enough, about it. I have other strong opinions. Uh, when <laughs> I look at, at, at Pakistan, I see an archipelago of militant training camps that, that, are, that are numerous opportunities uh, for, for individuals who radicalize abroad to come to Pakistan for training. And, and people who doubt that can merely look at the various European and British conspiracies. Um, I am dismayed that you know, we, what we essentially have is a trade space that we do some activities to prosecute one interest, but that those activities massively undermine other interests. And that we don't actually have a strategic, we actually don't have a strategy that integrates all of these simultaneous interests that are resident in Pakistan. So let me give you an example. Um, for what would appear to be, from my optic, theater level effects, we are bombing targets in Fatah. It would be great if one of those targets were, bin, were to be bin Laden and that that target uh, was in fact to be successfully uh, targeted. But in fact, it does appear as if these, these Fatah attacks, though they have theater level effects in Afghanistan, have strategic level consequences for our effort to engage Pakistanis on the war on terror. And so this to me seems a very, to be a very big problem that we're using these attacks in Fatah when it's not integrated into a larger strategy. I'm also very conflicted. Um, if in fact we're going to make the defeat of the Taliban in Afghanistan the goal, we are essentially structuring a conflict with Pakistan that is not resolvable. And I'm going to put a proposition out on the table that Pakistan is always going to be more important to U.S. national interests than Afghanistan is. Um, there will be more international terrorists in Pakistan than ever in Afghanistan by sheer numbers alone. It also has nuclear weapons, and while I don't subscribe to this idea of the Islamic nuclear threat, um, what is more apparent is the constant danger of an Indo-Pakistan conflict arising over a militant attack, and then the subsequent nuclear perils uh, that devolve from that. And we have 170 million, who deep, 170 million Pakistanis who deeply dislike our policy, and when you look at public opinion polling, 
They fear us more than Al Qaeda, and there are very large majorities that support militant groups. And so I have to, we have to put on the table this trade space in which we're operating, pursuing one policy at the expense of others. Uh, good question. A couple of very, very brief thoughts. One is I do not believe that killing or capturing bin Laden will lead to strategic defeat of the organization. Um, it won't, it, it may be a necessary, but it certainly is not a sufficient condition. But I think the more, the more important issue is a perception one. I think the inability of the United States and other governments to capture or kill bin Laden actually creates a perception of weakness. So I think that's actually the biggest danger of, of failing to capture or kill him, is it l makes, makes uh, the United States look incompetent, weak in its ability to do that. And so I think in that sense, three, capturing or killing him would begin to, uh, at least for a short period of time, begin to change that perception. So I think the more important issue is at, is at least on one of perception, but again, I don't think this will turn the tide in any meaningful way. Just a quick comment on that. I mean, if von Stauffenberg had killed Hitler in 1944 with a bomb under the conference room table, World War II would have ended much quicker. And I'm not, well, we're in a very different kind of conflict than, uh, than World War II, but certain people make a difference. It's very hard to explain why Napoleon was in Moscow in 1812 without understanding Napoleon's personality. Very hard to explain the Holocaust without Hitler. Al-Qaeda is bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri's idea. 9-11 was their idea. If you took bin Laden off the table, guess who would take over the organization? Ayman Zawahiri. A very, very good outcome because people don't like this guy. People love bin Laden. He is a spiritual leader to not only people in al-Qaeda but the whole jihadist movement. Ayman al-Zawahiri is regarded as divisive, not a natural leader. You'd want to actually keep him in place as a leader of the organization because he would run it into the ground. James Meek of the Daily News. Thanks. As Peter said, James Meek from the New York Daily News. Um, you all have articulated beautifully all the many, many problems that we have in Afghanistan. But uh, the presidential candidates, Obama and McCain, the president, the top uh, general in Afghanistan, the top officer at the Pentagon, all say we need a lot more combat troops. They don't have them, but we need a lot more combat troops. They're adding some. Well, what I'd like to hear from each member of the panel is how do we win and get out of Afghanistan? If you could bullet point that, each of you, please. <laughs> more troops means more contact with the so-called enemy, more calls for support, for air, uh, for air support, more civilian casualties, more alienating the Afghan population. Uh, more time testing the patience of the rest of the non-Pashtun Afghans. How long are they willing to tolerate? Uh, foreign Christians in their country, um, so I, and you don't have the amount of troops uh, you could possibly want to patrol every village. I think that's one of the lessons I saw in these villages, uh, where you can go for days, and the only sign of the Americans may be the occasional helicopter flying, flying overhead. So you'd need like 100,000 more troops, and you're not going to get them. And I think there's no notion of, I think the concept of winning here is just as um, irrelevant as, as it is in Iraq. There's, there's no Winning, there's no victory unless you mean defeating the Afghans. If you want to get rid of the Taliban, you're going to have to kill, in a way, the entire Pashtun population or, or push them out. Not that they all support the Taliban, but this is where they find their support. This is where they, they seek shelter. The Israelis have tried this in South Lebanon. They've tried to destroy as many Shia villages as possible to get rid of Hezbollah. It's only had the opposite effect. I think you have to start wondering why is the U.S. in Afghanistan? Should the U.S. be in Afghanistan? Um, is uh, Terrorism is really such a serious threat. Um, are there more important things to worry about? And certainly as long as there's Pakistan, it doesn't really matter what happens in Afghanistan anyway. So I think the whole concept of victory uh, just doesn't apply here. Christine? No, I kind of share his skepticism. Uh, no matter what happens in Afghanistan, we have a mess in Pakistan. And there is this inescapable reality that what happens in Afghanistan, what happens in uh, Bagram, I mean, I, I like the point that was made early about Bagram, what happens in Abu Ghraib, all of these things really affect um, our ability to engage what I think is a far more important country. That being said, there are very legitimate security interests uh, in Afghanistan in the region. Uh, I think there are probably things that can be done better. Um, you know, part of the, the, the perception of occupation is because they're really, and I hate to use this buzzword, but I think it is important, is Afghan ownership. 
you know, the, the, the Afghan parliament remains an institution that has some credibility. Yet the Afghan parliament really hasn't been engaged even on something as fundamental as the Afghan national development strategy. So perhaps the Afghan parliament should be brought in to bear about the international troops to discuss uh, its size, what it does, what its mission is. I mean, I think if we're going to talk about democracy, then there should be some uh, utility in engaging democratic institutions that so many lives have been uh, uh, basically spared to build. I think there are also a number of activities that additional troops uh, could do that are very important. Um, it's absolutely critical that Afghanistan it lives in a dangerous neighborhood. It is surrounded by predatory states that want to prosecute their interests. It's imperative that the country have uh, a police force and that it has an army. But yet if you look at the billets for mentors in those activities, they are so massively understaffed by numbers. And of course, if you were to then discount for the quality of those trainers, you'd be also surely disappointed. And there are very important corollary support activities that should go on that haven't gone on. So for example, training police without a functioning Ministry of Justice, you just make a security service. So I, I, we have very serious resource constraints. Um, there's also constraints on um, Afghan absorption capacity, so it's not just about money. But I think that there are things that could be done in a positive way with this plus up of troops. Seth? Uh, I've got a slightly different take in the sense that, um, um, uh, although I, I agree with a lot of what, what Chris just said, um, I think fundamentally, uh, as, as uh, a, a U.S. intelligence officer told Bruce Hoffman and I in March when we were along the border, um, you know, you guys recognize the border, but we don't. I mean, you can't treat this anymore as an Afghan or a Pakistan problem. This is a regional issue. So I think our goal, in my view, what my goal would be is to end or at least to minimize the uh, insurgency led by groups that have a relationship with al-Qaeda where you could get... Uh, training camps, and you certainly have gotten training camps for groups that are targeting the West, including the United States. If we do not get that end, I think we put ourselves in the same position as we were in in the 1990s, which is a much more dangerous uh, world, including one where there are direct threats to the United States. I think, in general, the strategy has got to be to increasingly Afghanize uh, this uh, counterinsurgency effort in Afghanistan. And what does that mean? That means at least two things. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with more troops uh, on the ground. The better question for me is what you do with those troops. Are you going to use troops to conduct unilateral direct action operations against militants? Or are you going to use them to build better local forces? Uh, and I think that the, the fact that we have such a huge gap in the percentage of mentors and partners, U.S. and other international mentors and partners, in both the police and the army is a sign, I think, that we have spent too much time conducting direct action operation as opposed to partnering efforts. Uh, the second part of this is, to, is in my view, to, to um, uh, uh, take this top-down concept and, and include a bottom-up aspect of working with uh, lo local groups in villages and districts across the country. Um, so what you get really is uh, both sort of the situation you had between 1933 and 1973 in Afghanistan during the reign of Zahir Shah, which is some combination of a top-down government that, that can protect some areas, especially urban ones, and a bottom-up effort in rural areas of the country. But again, this is one not by the U.S. or NATO. This is, uh, this is stabilized, if it's stabilized, by the Afghans. We're going to take one more question, lady in front. Thank you. My name is uh, Professor Carol Dysinger from NYU, and uh, I'm making a documentary about the training of the Afghan National Army and have spent an ungodly amount of time for the past three years <laughs> in um, various places where they are being trained and mentored and taken into um, various forms of contact with their American, British, French, Spanish, and the Mongolians were there for, for a short bit of time. And what I noticed and I would like to ask you about <clears throat> is um, there were a number of young Afghan officers, many of which NCO trained, many of, which had, many of whom had remained in Afghanistan through most of the fight, not gone to Pakistan or Iran, who were truly wished for a modern army. They truly had a strong love of their country, of their tribe, of their family. They would talk about old mind, this does not have good result, Carol John, new mind, this is what we need. And there, but laying over them is an officer class that is... Uh, corrupt and is not um, uh, 
That is not corrected by the government, by MOD. Sometimes it is, but very rarely. I feel like corruption is there a is question a embedded in this? Yes, it's, yeah. here it is. How do you deal with corruption when you bring in so much money to um, train these people? Okay, one minute each. And any final thoughts? I don't have any thoughts about corruption, but uh, one thought I just want to elaborate on, because I don't think you can defeat Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, and these are just movements of angry guys, and it's not even so much about Islam, it's, it's about the fight, and if there's a fight creates the cult. In the 70s, the same people might have been fighting you as the American Empire, as Marxists, or as, as nationalists in, in some more secular way. And staying in Afghanistan is counterproductive. Um, the longer you stay, the more you're going to alienate people. And uh, obviously, you want to prevent attacks from happening. Uh, the war of, of ideas is just a silly notion. This is a, this is a real war. If you want to prevent people from wanting to kill you, um, stop killing Muslims. Uh, I think it sounds silly and simple, but it's really that simple from the eyes of the people of the region. If you leave us alone, there will be no reason for people to want to seek revenge on you. Um, stop supporting the Israeli occupation of Palestine, stop occupying foreign countries, um, stop supporting dictatorships, and you'll see that there won't really be a motive. And then I think what you see is Al-Qaeda will be turning its attention to Shias um, more and more, and, and there will be a lot more internal violence, but at least you won't worry about attacks on your own territory. Thanks. I actually think the corruption issue is very important, not only in the military, but if you were to uh, look at the opinion polls that Seth mentioned, uh, when you do ask the small numbers of folks why they support the Taliban, corruption in the government and securities is, is usually cited as, as one, uh, as the top or second top answer. Um, the average Afghan, uh, if they have any contact at all with the government, it's going to be with the police, and that is inevitably a corrupt encounter. And then, you know, this isn't delicate to say, but, you know, what surrounds the Karzai government is a massive cloud of corruption. Um, anyone who goes to Afghanistan knows the rumors surrounding his family members in the narcotics trade. The chiefs of police, the governors, they're all involved in the narcotics trade, from Badakhshan down to Nimruz. And so, you know, if, if you really take seriously what the counterinsurgency literature says, you have to actually have a, a, a government that actually has some credibility. And I would argue that um, apart from security, the, the pervasiveness of corruption is one of the biggest impediments to achieving that precise goal. Seth. I strongly agree with Chris's comments. I mean, I think there are issues in the, in the uh, and your comments on the Afghan National Army uh, are actually even more, uh, I've spent time on the ground with the Army, as well as I think they're actually even more appropriate for the police. Um, there are, historically, in other, other countries, there have been efforts to, and there is an effort to transmit money through bank accounts to individuals rather than send them through higher level army or police officials uh, in inspector general's office in the ministries, uh, although that can create some problems. Um, but I think, um, among other things, there, there is clearly a lack of will in, in the country to prosecute individuals at the senior member, at the senior levels of some of these organizations including senior levels of both the Ministry of Defense and in particular the Ministry of Interior to prosecute them um, for a range of reasons. For a range of reasons because this is an election year, because we're in the middle of an insurgency and we don't want to make it worse. Uh, or, uh, I mean, there, there may be a range of other reasons. But I think, as Chris noted, the problem is, I think the corruption challenge is actually appears to be driving part of the uh, uh, insurgency. People become fed up with this government because of the corruption at all levels of the organization, including the Afghan National Army and the Ministry of Defense. And if that is not fixed, you will find probably the death knell of any counterinsurgency effort is you lose the population. Great. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you to the panel.